May 2nd, 1974. It's the night of the Brighton Community School Spring Party, and after an evening of fun with their classmates, Ed and Molly Walton search for their ride home. Their father's best friend and business partner, Felix Kranken, co-founder of Bunny Smiles Incorporated, the company behind Bond's Burgers. Come on, Molly. Let's go. This way. Unfortunately, Felix had his own evening of fun, drinking. Look, there he is. When Felix comes to, he goes to check on the twins, but tragically, neither of them survived. Still drunk, in a panic, Felix buries the children in the nearby San Juanita forest. Clutching Ed and Molly's backpack and prized Rocket Rabbit doll, both now stained with the twins' blood, the disgraced co-founder of Bond's Burgers begins to walk. Consumed by guilt, Felix approaches a nearby cliff and begins tossing the children's belongings into the water below. He moves to end his own life. But he doesn't. He can't. The Theft King channel is all about adorable puppies and kittens. If you don't subscribe to Theft King, you hate adorable puppies and kittens. You don't hate adorable puppies and kittens, do you? When Felix never arrives to drop the twins off, their father, Jack Walton, begins to grow hysterical and after countless unanswered phone calls to his business partner's house, Jack gets in his car and drives there to confront his best friend. I told you 
Jerome Pierre was. I told you Jerome Pierre, please. Uh, I'm, I'm calling this cool. I mean, I'm not just telling you that. I'm here. This is some brand you're trying to pull. I don't find it funny, so please. Don't make me drive over there if you If you anything to those kids, I'll fucking kill you. If you remember this story, this is the However, Ed and Molly didn't die. As the Walton Files 4 begins, we see the twins heading to the adult section to get Felix, but it's quickly replaced by a bright light as the two children walk into a foggy white purgatory. A vast, empty, grassy field lined with a small wooden fence. The twins are dead, literally buried, but they're still here, trapped somewhere between life and death. And unfortunately, they're not alone. It will eventually become your new body. It's been almost three years since the Walton Files 3 Bunny Farm released, and I'm not gonna lie, the wait has been agonizing. Creator Martin Walls- Oh. oh. Paredes. Oh, because that means walls in Spanish, right? Uh, in that case, for the rest of this video, I shall be referred to as El Robo Rey. The Walton Files 4 begins with a promotional video from Bunny Smiles Inc. featuring Bond's Burgers' four performing animatronics, Buzu, Banny, Shah, and Bon, performing on stage in a recreation of the intro from the series' first episode. While the visuals have come a long way since then, the series retains its undeniably unique style. Over the last five years, new graphics hardware has made photorealistic 3D rendering accessible to amateur creators, and as a result, the vast majority of analog horror is just that. Blair Witch Project style first person shaky cam segments. The Walton File sets itself apart from its contemporaries by utilizing this incredibly uncanny composited 2D animation style and it just looks fantastic. There's really nothing else like it. Throughout the segment we see several strange distortions and glitches, with the most prevalent being this pale, suited figure. Next, we see a promotional video from Bunny Smiles Incorporated featuring Cyber Telly who touts the incredible capabilities of their animatronic technology. Beautiful, isn't it? This is one of the first mech models built by Cyberfun Tech to bring the magic of Bond's Burgers to life. Today, we'll take a journey through the magic of the showstoppers and how they were created. You might learn a thing or two about the quality of our company. of the showstoppers, the face of Bunny Smiles Inc. Concept art is a very vital part of any good design. So many different ideas to... The Bunny Smiles Incorporated art department was in charge of pitching up multiple designs for the characters and creating the designs we all know and love. However, as the concept art section begins, the tape starts to glitch and as Rosemary Walton is introduced as the lead artist behind the characters, we notice that her husband's name, Jack Walton, is very deliberately censored. Rosemary Walton, loving wife of... is a brilliant artist with a huge passion for poetry and the theatrical and has done numerous art pieces before becoming the lead artist in BSI. She's the one in charge of making the final designs that would later become the characters they are today. I think I always had a pretty clear idea of how each character looked like. In my mind, the designs just made sense to me. I wanted to make them seem appealing to younger audience, while still being simple enough so they can be easy to remember. The next section has engineer Susan Woodings touting the many capabilities of the restaurant's animatronics. It's revealed that both she and her colleague Charles Brooks were originally part of Cyberfun Tech before partnering with Bunny Smiles Inc. to bring the animatronic to life. Bunny Smiles originally reached Cyberfun to make their blueprints for the animatronics. But we all got so invested to the idea that we decided to have a full partnership with BSI. I'm Susan Woodings, the lead technical engineer of Bunny Smiles. We 
We added a ton of features into the models. We managed to even make them have the ability to walk and interact with the audience. However, in the midst of the tape, we see an upside down and mirrored image of a letter written to Bonds Burgers co-founder Felix Kranken. I'm warning you right now, like most of the written content in the Walton Files, it's it's not super coherent. It's redundant and doesn't really read like a human wrote it, but I'll do my best. Mr. Kranken, this is Norman. I'm sending you this letter on behalf of our deal between Bunny Smiles and Cyberfun Tech, and most importantly, the well-being of our Cyberfun staff. We've been getting a lot of complaints about a member of our staff going missing who is highly associated with you and your team. Susan Woodings has been missing for a week now, and here in Cyberfun Tech, we are working as hard as we can to try and manage to get in touch with her. Is there perhaps any detail you could hand us to help us locate our missing employee? I'm going to be honest with you, Mr. Kranken, and tell you I have a lot of questions and suspicions about whatever is going on at your company. Whatever it is, it's making both your name and mine look bad to public light, so again, if there's anything that could help us find Susan, write us back immediately. Thank you. I'll see you Monday. Wait, if Norman's gonna see Felix on Monday, how is this letter gonna reach him first? It's the 70s, it's not an email. However, the screen then glitches, revealing a strange, barely coded message. Susan has been struggling to breathe for two days. The console. Here is where all the information and code is stored in the audio animatronics. How they can walk, sing, interact with the audience, etc. That's how they manage to feel so lifelike to our audience. The console is also able to recognize specific people and places. We then see some notes from Charles Brooks regarding the development of the animatronics, and the first few weeks seem to go pretty well. Next, we witness the walk-around test from January 21st, 1974, during which Susan and Charles verify the functionality of the developing robots. Ah, this is how it's supposed to go. We place the tunnel objects around the room. The animatronic is supposed to get to us without bumping into any of the tables, boxes, chairs, etc. Sounds good to me. What happens if the robot falls or comes across any object? Well, then we're just going to have to test this out again until we get this right. It'll be a long night, then. <laughs> you said it. Unfortunately, in their first test, Banny bumps into a table, necessitating repairs. All right, everything seems fine so far. Should the robot be so close to the table? I don't think oh. so. <laughs> Fuck, I told you to watch for the table, man! Well, damn it! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What's kind of fucking up? Uh, where's the rent? I'll uh, check the drawer. I think Jack left. About six weeks later, on March 7th, the two have begun testing the robot's cutting-edge facial recognition software. However, as the recording begins, we hear Susan and Charles discussing Felix's increasingly disruptive drinking problem. I don't know where he is either. I know, I know. I'm just... Yeah, uh, a little worried. Did Linda call? She did, yeah. I'm gonna be totally honest with him. Knowing Felix, he's probably drinking somewhere in town. Does Jack or uh, Rose know? Nope. I don't think Linda told him how to either. Susan, we have to tell them. I think even Chris knows about the addiction. Let's just focus on work for now, shall we? Right. So, uh, I'm checking my notes right now. What's up to do? Well, Norman said we should start testing the facial tracking feature, so we're going to have the yeah, robot walk around and see if it recognizes our faces. Well, we checked that already. Jack brought in Molly here, and the console recognized that. Well, yeah, but we're going to do a secondary test, because the console seems to have trouble detecting the faces. Oh, the test we did with Sophie, right. Mm-hmm. Let's see how this test goes. Apparently, the animatronics facial scanners worked fine when they tested them on Ed and Molly, yet failed to recognize their older sister Sophie's face. This provides new context for Brian Stell's death in The Walton Files 1. After murdering Brian, Bond scanned his face, and Brian goes on to say that he thought I was her. Bond thought Brian was Sophie, and now we know why. It's because the robots have trouble discerning her face in particular. It's probably the reason she's the only member of the Walton family who survived the tragic events of 1974. As the test continues, Shaw eventually reaches Susan and Charles and scans their faces, correctly identifying both of them. Everything seems to be working properly. Huh. 
So that means no more testing for today? Yep, pretty much. Ah, oh, sweet. That could really use a beer right now. That reminds me of what we were talking about earlier. In the wake of the accident that killed Ed and Molly, Felix began to lose it. His wife had just left him over his drinking problem, and in the midst of his despair, it seemed as if the man was going insane. May 5th. Three days after the accident. I haven't been able to sleep since last week. I finally told him what happened. It, it was in my office. Those were, were it was the longest hour of my life. The most painful conversation I've ever had. Pain in their eyes, the, the anger. They both hate me now. And I, I don't blame them. I have no idea what, what's going to happen to me now. My life, my business, everything. But but the fact the fact they're still buried down there. It haunts me every night. Seeing me up inside. Rosemary asked about the doll. I I told her they, they that they left it at school. That was a lie. I don't know what to do with the doll. Wherever I go, there it is. And I can't get myself to get rid of it. It's like a constant reminder of this huge mistake and how there's nothing I can do to make it better. He'd hear strange banging sounds from the closet, but when Felix went to check inside, all he found was the bloodied Rocket Rabbit doll. Despite the fact that it seemed to be tormenting him, Felix couldn't bring himself to get rid of the Rocket Rabbit toy, instead returning it to the restaurant. Two months after the facial recognition testing, something called the glitch occurs. As the recording begins, we hear the two technicians discussing Felix's car accident and the resulting deaths of Ed and Molly Walton. What does that mean? That's what I heard, man. He was drunk while driving the car? Tell me your voice, all right? Do you know what else some weeks ago? They didn't tell us? It was private, Charles. Only the family were there. Mark. How's Jack holding up? Haven't heard of him in a long while. I barely even see him at work. You don't think Felix's story... Why, don't you? A story? I think it's bullshit. I think something else happened, man. Something worse. God! So they're gone? Molly and Ed? Listen, I don't even want to think about it. Sit here with that freaking fucking doll in the room. What's it doing here? I feel like they're here. Tell us not to know Jack over here. Shit. I don't even want to be involved in this shit anymore. Alright, let's just try it the same way. This is fucked up. I don't even want to make it. Same. Let's just check up on the other ones for now. Let's check up on the games. However, as Susan and Charles leave the room, we see the rocket doll approaching the Buzu animatronic, and when the latter scans its face, the computer initially claims that no faces were found before it seemingly corrects itself. Oh, 
For some reason, the Buzu animatronic is recognizing the Rocket Rabbit doll as being both Ed and Molly. A month later, on June 30th, 1974, we see the final recording from Susan and Charles, the first. The scene once again opens with a top-down view of the Bonds Burgers backroom, but this time, Susan and Charles are elsewhere in the restaurant, their muffled voices audible in the background. <laughs> With no one present in the room, suddenly, a strange face emerges, seemingly out of thin air. The same face we saw in the glitches at the very start of the tape. And it's approaching the Bon animatronic. In a strange scene, the disfigured face seems to merge with the Bon robot. And just as it does, Susan walks into the room. Unaware that anything unusual has occurred in the back room, Susan begins to perform her duties using the terminal when she's distracted by a noise in what should be an empty room. As Bond murders Susan in cold blood, the Rocket Rabbit doll watches from the corner, and we see Bond press his finger to his lips, though it isn't clear whether or not this is directed at Rocket. Prying the Banny mask off its animatronic endoskeleton, Bond goes to do something horrible, and Rocket's eyes open, having changed to those of Ed and Molly. The twins have seen everything. <laughs> Cutting back to the strange purgatory that Ed and Molly entered upon death, we witness a conversation between the two. It seems as if Molly wants to try and help Susan, but Ed is skeptical. Quick, she's in here. Molly, I don't think we should. You saw what he did to her. He hurt her. He made her bleed. I don't want her to be hurt anymore. It's not fair. Molly, th that's not our problem. Please, Ed, we have to find her. She doesn't deserve this. We have to. Fine, but be quiet. The scene then shifts to the perspective of Susan Wooding's spirit, having just entered the same purgatory that Ed and Molly now inhabit. I 
can hear you, Susan. I'm here. Where are you? Please, where am I? Don't you worry. You're in safe hands, Susan. Welcome to Wonderland. Your new home. Isn't it beautiful? Dead? No, 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 no. Not yet, at least. Your heart is still beating, but your body is now functionless. Out there, you're slowly suffocating, but here, you're safe. The spirit doesn't pass on quite as fast as the body does. I would know. Pleasure to meet you. My name is Bob. That thing that's been appearing in the tape since the very start. The one who possessed the Bond animatronic just before it murdered Susan. It is here as well. My name is Bob. And you're Susan. Hi. Hi. I know you very well, my friend. I know you like to fix things, isn't that right? Well, so do I. Wouldn't you like me to fix you? What are you talking about? Perhaps I could help you. Thank you. Take a look inside. That is the new you. A wonderful gift that will eventually become your new body. Just like a beautiful butterfly bursting from a cocoon. You will be reborn. What? What is it? You don't have to listen to me. That is up to you. But what other choice do you have? A spirit can survive without being tethered to a vessel. I know you're scared. I was too, but everything will be okay. I, I, I don't Apologies for what I had to do to you. But look, the hard part is over with now. Besides, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. When Susan opens her eyes, she finds herself back at Bond's Burgers in the real world. However, when she does, she finds that her corpse has been stuffed into Banny's animatronic suit. Interestingly, Bond mentions that they too were scared when faced with the prospect of remaining alive within an animatronic, which suggests that he too was once human. We know that Ed and Molly were able to possess Rocket Rabbit without any obvious intervention, so who was it that died and ended up inside of Bond? The obvious suspect is Jack Walton, seeing as he went missing around the same time, but I just don't know. 
Ed and Molly see both Bon and Susan's spirits disappear, unable to intervene. He's gone. They're both gone. How are we going to protect her now? Will she be all right? I... I don't know. We just have to wait, okay? All right. Come on, Molly. Let's go. In the years since Bunny Farm, the analog horror space has evolved a lot. Creators like Kane Pixel set a new bar for what amateur YouTube animations can be, and I started to wonder if The Walton Files was really all that. Like, yeah, it was good for the time, but can Martin really deliver after three years? Is it really going to hold up against the amazing standard that's been set? Oh yes, The Walton Files 4 Part 1 is the best analog horror video I've ever seen. Martin is the real deal.